Anyone here like Snickers? Anybody a fan of Snickers? Yeah. Um, in 2010, there was quite possibly the greatest Super Bowl commercial ever. Um, that was a Snickers commercial. Some of you probably have seen this commercial that stars uh, the late Betty White. Uh, does anyone know the Snickers commercial I'm talking about? There's a, there's a bunch of guys. They're playing at a park. They're playing um, tag football and two-hand touch. And uh, Betty White appears. She's appearing as one of the guys. And uh, she gets laid out in the middle of the field and gets tackled. Um, although I thought they were playing two-hand touch, so I'm not really sure what's going on. She gets laid out. Um, and they're like, come on, man, what's going on? And she's like, you've been riding me all day, you know? And there's this whole encounter. And then um, she walks over, and um, she's actually supposedly, you know, a guy, and she takes a Snickers from the guy's girlfriend, and, and she becomes the guy again. And the, the, the commercial says, you're not you when you're hungry. And then it says, Snickers satisfies. You're not you when you're hungry. I would encourage you this afternoon, it's 30 seconds, to just go look up Snickers commercial Betty White. I'm not doing it justice. Uh, you need to watch it. It's rather hilarious, I'll be honest with you. And it's been deemed as one of the greatest uh, commercials of all time. Um, so take, take a look at that. Um, but I wanted to start uh, our time together this morning with a question for you and for us. And that question stems out of this Snickers Super Bowl commercial. And that is, what are you hungry for? Simple question. I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> Write it down. What are you hungry for? And a similar question in the same vein is the question, are you satisfied? What are you hungry for? And are you satisfied? Last week, I sought to expound a bit on the nature of the devil, the Satan. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to be here last week, which... By the way, the presence of God was so palpable last week in our gathering. It was such a celebration to watch those that were getting baptized come up out of the water into resurrection life. So, wonderful time. But if you didn't get a chance to be here last week, I encourage you to listen to the teaching. I expounded on the nature of the devil and his baseline strategy of attack. For us to consider who the devil is, a, a non-physical, personal being in this world, not just an energy or a force or a concept or an idea, but an actual being according to the teachings of Jesus. And his attack on us is by way of accusation, slander, and lies. The very name devil in the Greek, as well as Satan in Hebrew, means accuser, slanderer, or liar. And he seeks to seduce us as a tempter with lies. He seeks to seduce us with lies. He doesn't beat us up. He doesn't uh, physically dominate us, but he seeks to seduce our heart and mind with lies. This is what it means for him to be a tempter. A lie is a false statement made with deliberate intention to deceive what a lie is. A false statement made with deliberate intention to deceive. Most often when we lie, we are doing so intentionally. Otherwise, we just call it ignorance. <laughs> it is an intentional untruth. That is what a lie is. But seduction is to persuade or trick someone into doing something by making it very attractive. That's a definition from Cambridge Dictionary. To persuade or trick someone into doing something by making it very 
appealing, attractive, seemingly tasteful. It's a key paradigm for understanding the nature of the devil and the attack and scheme of the devil. He lies by making those lies seductive and attractive. In the wilderness, where we continue to find ourselves, there are three temptations or three seductions of the enemy. All grounded in, as we articulated, the questioning of the stability of Jesus' identity. He wants the devil, Jesus, to prove himself, to legitimize himself, to perform his identity through these three seductions, through these three temptations. And these three function as tests of his faithfulness to both Yahweh and his true identity. He has been deemed the beloved son. Now he must live out of being the beloved son. And these three temptations seek to undermine his identity and challenge his faithfulness to both Yahweh and who he truly is. So his how of approach is lies. That's his how. It's his strategy. But I want us to consider and notice the when of his approach. Not just the how, but the when. Verse 2, Matthew chapter 4 says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was, what? Hungry. Verse 3, the tempter, the seducer, came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He doesn't approach Jesus at the beginning of the fast. He approaches Jesus at the end of the fast. The text says after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He approaches him when he is hungry, the text says. When he is susceptible, when he is vulnerable, and when he is weak, that is when he approaches Jesus. And that is also when he approaches you and I. He approaches us often with lies and seductions when we are most vulnerable, most susceptible, most weak. In the the realm of kind of AA, and it's filtered into uh, psychotherapy, there's an acronym that's been helpful for me that is uh, H-A-L-T. It's the word HALT. Has anyone heard this before? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And we have to be cognizant of these postures that we have. When we are hungry, we tend to make irrational decisions. Do we not? Think about what you usually eat at dinner versus what you eat at 10 o'clock at night. Very different. Think about what you buy at the grocery store when you're hungry versus when you're not. We tend to make irrational decisions. I don't know how many Taco Bell runs I went on in college at 11.30 at night. Up playing NBA 2K with my roommates. And one person just says, hey man, why don't we go get Taco Bell? I'm kind of hungry. And I'm like, well, of course. Obviously, what else are we going to do? You know, I ate Taco Bell and Steak and Shake at hours of the night. I never should have. Ever. When we are hungry, our, our cognition is actually impaired. There's a lot of research around this. There's great impact on our decision making and our focus and our attention. This is why when you are hungry, there's a good chance you also become angry. And when you're angry and hungry, you become what? 
hangry. Some of us more than others. Or there's the sense that all I'm thinking about is food right now. I literally can't think about anything else except for food. Hungry impacts so much of our anatomy, our physiology, and even our neurology. But there is this sense that when we are either hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we make irrational decisions. And the enemy knows this about humanity. And he knows this about your humanity. So we have to be that much more aware when we are feeling one of these dispositions. The tempter comes to Jesus when he is hungry, when he is susceptible, vulnerable, and weak. He does not come when he is full, but when he is lacking, when he actually is feeling his emptiness. He's feeling his emptiness. The original word for hungry can mean to suffer want. To suffer want. As well as to crave ardently or to seek with eager desire. That's the notion of, of hungry in the original language. So it's safe to say that the text could literally read, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he wanted food. He was suffering from wanting something to eat. I mean, the man's been fasting for six weeks. He is hungry. And he is suffering from want. And I think craving ardently some food. But what is the actual temptation here? Is it just to turn stones into bread? Keep in mind what's happening in the wilderness is mirroring the story of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Or is told by uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 through Deuteronomy chapter 8. So if you want to go back and read that, you can. There's a, there's a parallel here. But what is the actual temptation? Is it just to turn stones into bread? I don't think so. I think there's something more. What is the enemy actually getting at here? I think that it's twofold. There's a unification of physical and spiritual here in terms of the seductions and the temptations. I'm only going to focus on one today, but there are two temptations, I think, in this seduction to turn stones into bread. The first is the temptation towards self-satisfaction or to satisfy yourself. The second is the temptation, which I'm not going to give much time to today, and that is self-preservation or to save yourself. The temptation to self-satisfaction and the temptation to self-preservation. Take note that the enemy starts not with knowledge, but with desires. Not with thoughts or beliefs, but with wants wants. Specifically, the urges of the body. Cravings, drives, bodily desires. Why might this be? Why might this be? The enemy doesn't primarily attack belief or knowledge or intellect or rationality or comprehension. He attacks wants and desires. He does this because we as human beings are most driven not by beliefs or what we have knowledge of, but by what it is we want. You and I are not primarily driven by what we know. If I want to get to know you, I'm not going to ask you what you know. I'm going to ask you what you love. 
What do you want? What are your desires? We are driven not by our intellect, but our loves. Not our acumen, but our affections. And remember the definition of seduction. To persuade or trick someone into doing something by making it very attractive, desirable. Sin is made to look pretty. Sin is made to look appealing. Sin is made to look tasteful. Or as it says in Genesis chapter 3, right before the fall of man, pleasing to the eye. If sin were a person, it would be the most beautiful person you've ever seen in your life. Attractive. Beautiful. What in the world? In Jesus' name, what was that? Lord, come Lord, come Lord. (laughs) Sin is made to look attractive. Sin is made to look appealing. Sin is meant to taste good. The question though is, is sin good? Lies alone, friends, don't work. Lies alone do not work. They must be made attractive for you and I. They must be made appealing to our desires. So the enemy is playing on the law that we are most driven by our desires. We are most driven by our wants. There's a phenomenal book I would encourage you all to check out, as I often try to resource you, uh, and that is the book You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. A very impactful book on my life. I encourage you all to consider it. And in it, he's a philosopher. He, He says this. He says, our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behavior flow. Despite modernity's notion that we are thinking things, or as he says, brains on a stick, or as Rene Descartes says, you know, I think, therefore I am, we're actually not so much thinking things as we are, first of all, lovers, creatures of desire, creatures of want, primarily. He says, you can't think your way into new hungers, You can't think your way into Christ-likeness. You can't think your way into sanctification. You can't think your way into transformation. You can't think your way into new wants or new hungers. Usually, what captures our attention most is what we most want. Money, relationships, popularity, power, authority sex, possessions, safety, security, whatever. It is those things that capture our attention the most because it's what we most want. Our ethics, how we live, follow often our desires if we consider that ethics have to do with choices that we make and how we live. Often they follow our desires. So our beliefs matter, certainly. Our understanding matters. But they only provide justification. They only legitimize. But our wants and our motivations ultimately are what dictate or direct our life. It is our motivations that dictate and move our life forward. And the issue at hand in this text is what the enemy wants Jesus to do with the desire. The desire isn't so much the issue. It's what do you do with the desire? Because I believe that all desires we have have been given by God and can be fulfilled by God. But the question becomes, what do you do with said desire? And is it distorted or not? 
how is Jesus going to act in response to this desire, to this hunger? So the enemy is saying to Jesus, I think, satisfy yourself. It's how you feel, right? It's how you feel. It's what you want, isn't it? Don't you want food? You're hungry. It's what your body is asking for. If your body wants it, give it to your body. In fact, I bet you can't even survive if you don't act on the urge. The enemy's testing, I think, Jesus' ability to survive in the wilderness. I bet you can't survive if you don't act on the urge. How often is that the mantra of our hedonistic society? You can't even survive if you don't act out on said desire, said urge. And better yet, Jesus, by the way, Jesus, you actually have the power to turn these stones into bread. You can do it. No one else can do it, but man, you can do it. Because you're God, right? You're the son of God, correct? Throughout the New Testament, this bodily urge or animalistic-like craving is called the flesh. The flesh. In Ephesians chapter 4, it is referred to as deceitful desires. Deceitful desires. Notice that it is a specific kind of desire. A distorted desire. Of which have the ability, as the text says, to corrupt a person. Or to destroy a person. And in Galatians chapter 5, the acts and desires of the flesh are put in contrast to the acts and desires of the spirit. There's a contrast between flesh and spirit. Look at what the text says in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. The word in the Greek for indulge can also mean to resource or a base of operations. Do not use your freedom to resource the flesh. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires, here it is, the contrast, what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. Notice the comparison. And notice that the sentiment here is that to indulge the flesh or to indulge these animalistic-like cravings is actually contrary to freedom and a kind of enslavement. To indulge the flesh is actually contrary to freedom and a kind of enslavement. And we live in a society that the highest good is freedom. The whole U.S. experimental project 300 years ago was built on the notion of the pursuit of freedom. But we have distorted our understanding of what true freedom actually means. But here, in this text, it says to indulge the flesh is actually contrary to freedom. Even though in our society, the notion of freedom is do whatever you want. The heart wants what it wants. Do what you desire. Do what feels good. Do what feels right. It's not freedom from. It's freedom to do whatever you want to do. And the focus is on self-satisfaction, the pursuit of pleasure. 
Now, in a post-Freudian world, 100 years later, in 2024, the instruction given from Galatians chapter 5 is in direct opposition. I want us to be aware of that. Freudian thought says, if your body wants it, do it. Give yourself to all of your urges. Some of you are like, why are we talking about Freud? It's a hundred years later. Because the ideas of Freud have been systematized into culture. The notion of do what makes you feel good is a Freudian notion. Freudian idea. But for Freud, you are, at best, a biologically fixed, pleasure-seeking animal machine. And the fundamental high point of the human experience is to indulge your flesh, to satisfy yourself. But Freud knows that if we actually do that, it will undermine society. And it will eliminate civilization. So he says there are ex external restraints put on us to repress our desires. And our life is in pursuit of liberating those desires so we can't actually do what our body is telling us to do. Satisfy yourself. But if desires are infinite, and they are, is that even possible? I agree. <laughs> if desires are insatiable, they're infinite, is it possible for you to satisfy yourself? It seems to me that it's not. Freedom for Freud is primarily about feeling good, doing whatever you want, omitting the call to being good. There is a distinction between feeling good and being good. Just because you feel good doesn't mean that you're being good. But I will say, if you're being good, there is great research in contemporary positive psychology that would say you're going to feel good. Secular research. I actually think to be good provides greater satisfaction. But in our society, the narrative of our world, the ideas of our time says to to elevate, we are to elevate feeling good over being good. How's it working for us? So why not quote Dallas Willard? He says, desire does not address the issue of what is good. It simply says, I want that. And it neglects everything else. Desire does not address what is good. It simply says, I want that. That's all it says. And I would argue this morning that Freudian psychology that's infiltrated our culture eliminates being in the world altogether in exchange purely for robotic and instinctual function. Freudian psychology produces human doings, not human beings. So, why might Paul in Galatians 5 equate indulging the flesh with enslavement? If we're told that's actually a good thing, it's what we're supposed to do, indulge the flesh. Because... To live reactionarily to your bodily cravings eliminates your freedom. It eliminates your agency. It eliminates your choice. I don't know if you knew this or not, but Freud was a determinist. Freud was a secular Calvinist. No shade to my Calvinist friends, but Freud was one of yours. <laughs> he was a determinist. You struggle with divine determinism? Don't submit to Freudian psychology. You have no choice. You have no agency. You're an animal with urges and desires. You have no agency to choose. 
Choice is utterly obliterated in Freudian psychology. When you just live in response to your bodily urge, it's actually not a response. It's a reaction where you have no agency or choice. And do you know what we call it when you have no choice or agency or freedom? Enslavement. You know another word for that? Addiction. Addiction. And we live... Now, in an age, it's being referred to as the dopamine generation. What does dopamine often produce? Addicts. Are we enslaved? Or are we free? Adrian Von Kamm, another one of my boys, says, the man who cannot accept any binding is not free. He is the victim of his impulses, which may play their game with him and leave him helpless in the storms of his passions. When we live reactionarily to the flesh, we actually live a life that's purely compulsive. Or how about Carl Jung, who was a student of Freud and a dissenter of Freud, one who pushed back a lot of a lot against Freudian thought. He says, it is not the children of the flesh, but the children of God who know freedom. If there's anyone who knows Freud, it's Carl Jung. Secondarily, we must understand that we are more than flesh with animal-like, unrestrained, instinctual urges. We are enfleshed transcendent spiritual beings. You are an embodied spiritual being, a composite of flesh and spirit. It's what makes us unique. We don't just have urges, friends. We have longings. We don't just have instincts. We want intimacy. We don't just react, but we respond. We are not robotic. We are relational. We aren't just objects, but we are subjects. Willard goes on to say, the conflict between the flesh and the human spirit is the conflict between what I want and the will for what is best. It is, in fact, the conflict between desire and love. For love is always directed towards what is good and not at simply having my desires satisfied. There are a lot of things that we do out of love that are not desirable, but we choose to do them anyway. There are things that you do for your neighbor, your friends, your family out of love that you actually don't want to do. But because you choose to love the person, you actually restrain yourself. You practice temperance or self-control. It says our spirit is different from unrestrained flesh with its singular focus on satisfying desire. The spirit is able to consider alternatives and God prompts us to have an interest in what is better and best. Are the activities that you're engaged in, the desires you're responding to, and acting out on, are they the better thing? Are they the best thing? That's a fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves. And what happens to be one of the primary reasons that a person might would fast? Which is a spiritual practice and discipline, might have you, spiritual practice given that Jesus has chosen to fast. What is a reason? Fasting is a means of starving the flesh in order to strengthen the spirit. And was it not the Holy Spirit who led Jesus into the wilderness? Does the spirit leave Jesus 
doesn't say it. Does not say it. If anything, the Spirit is stronger in him and on him in the wilderness. He is fasting. He is weakening his flesh, but his spirit is becoming stronger because the Holy Spirit is with him and in him, giving him the strength to transcend his bodily urges and make the better choice. To transcend means to go beyond. He transcends his cravings. He transcends his physical urges. He transcends his desires to choose the better thing because of the Spirit. Without the Spirit, you can't transcend. You're enslaved to your flesh. But with the Spirit, you can transcend and choose alternatives. You don't have to cuss out your boss. You can choose a better route. (laughs) Right? Now, sometimes you do. But you don't have to. You don't have to. You know, I I really get frustrated with this cheap grace kind of mentality. Well, I'm just a poor, broken sinner who can't do anything good. Really? Is that the narrative of the scriptures? Certainly not. Certainly not. Even in Jesus, it's talking mastery over sin. Before Jesus. No. No. You can choose the better thing because the Spirit of God enables you to. You don't have to indulge the flesh. I I went through a season in my own life where I felt like I just could not choose something else. And I had a therapist look at me. He said, you're lying to yourself. You can choose a better way. You can. You have agency. One of the most important things, I think, as, as I've read a little bit, I've dabbled into, in psychotherapy, is to increase a person's sense of agency and freedom. You can choose an alternative because of the Spirit. In your flesh, you cannot, but by the Spirit of God, you can. You can transcend your fleshly urges. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, it says that Jesus came out of the wilderness, quote unquote, in the power of the Spirit. He came out of the wilderness with authority and power. When you resist the temptation of the enemy, it strengthens you, it strengthens your spirit, it strengthens your authority. Yes, your your, your flesh is weak, but your spirit is strong. He is able to resist. And do you know another reason that I think he is able to resist? It's because his desire and love for Yahweh is deeper than his surface level urge. This is important. A life lived indulging the flesh confuses and substitutes our deepest desires with our strongest desires. Your strongest desires are not always the same as your deepest desires. Let me prove it to you. There may come a point in your life and maybe in your 70s or 80s, I don't know, and um, your doctor's like, hey, man, if you keep eating this way, you're not going to be able to see your grandkids much longer. But what if you want both? You have a choice to make. What's the deeper desire? I'm going to assume it's to spend time with your grandkids. So you restrain sometimes the strongest desire. Or, are you ever in the grocery store in the aisle and there are all these magazines and all these beautiful people with all these tips and tricks on how to look the way they do? But on the other side of the aisle, there are candy bars, man. Right? Like Snickers everywhere, Reese's Cups, you know? Hershey's, 
you name it. Why is this? This is a picture of how our desires conflict. And they're using psychology to market your disordered desires. Because you want to look like that, but you sure do want to eat like that too. You, you can't have both without some restraint. You can't. We confuse our strongest desires with our deepest desires. Hunger of the body with hunger of the heart. And as Howard Thurman says, we are all roaming around with hungry hearts. These two are not the same thing. Not all of your desires are created equal. You have good desires and you have bad desires. But I promise you they can all find their satisfaction in the one who has created you. The one who provides a resource for infinite desires. Jesus is clearly in this scene hungry, as we have seen. He's gone weeks without food. We, we're not, we're not going to say he's not hungry. We're not going to say he doesn't have desire. He does. But in his hunger and in this temptation, what does he do? How does he resist the enemy? Yeah, he quotes scripture, certainly. This is important, I think, for us to have. But there is something more that he does that I found to be deeply compelling in terms of the scriptures that he chose. Do you ever think about that? Why did he choose those scriptures? Verse 10 says, this is the end of the scene. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Consider the authority. You can do the same thing. Away from me, Satan. And when he does that, guess where the enemy goes? Away. Doesn't mean he's not coming back. He's going to come back. But he does say, away from me. For it is written, worship. Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. I think, and I'm going to posit for you, that years of Jesus' worship have curated his deepest desires, affections, and motivations. The man was 12 years old in the temple, and his parents left him there because he's so captivated by the law which in the Old Testament, there's this constant theme of delighting in and enjoying and, and, and being gratified by the law of God, the word of God. At age 12, and it says he grew in wisdom and stature multiple times. For, for years now, his worship of Yahweh has actually curated his deepest desires, affections, and motivations to make them solidified. To where his primary aim isn't self-satisfaction, but self-surrender. He doesn't serve himself when he could, but he serves Yahweh and him alone. And in so doing, he knows, I think, that he will be ultimately satisfied and absolutely satisfied. He says earlier on, man cannot live on bread alone. Remember, hunger is a survival mechanism to help you and I survive. But he says that we actually need more than survival. We need flourishing. We need thriving. Do you know how many people I ask, hey, how's it going? How's life? Well, pff, surviving. Is that a life well lived? Honestly, no, man, you want to thrive. You want to flourish. I think he's also saying for man to truly live, man must worship Yahweh. Yes, we need to eat, but we also need to commune as well to worship. The Greek word for worship more literally means to lay on the ground face down in reverence, to prostrate oneself on the floor, in the dirt. Where did you and I come from? The dirt. It's to remember where you and I came from, to go from being upright to on the ground in worship, 
It's almost like, I think, I'm just picturing this in my, my head, there are all these stones that he could turn into bread, and the brother lays down in worship on the stones. Quoting Deuteronomy. How bad is that, man? Like, wow, what a move by Jesus. I imagine him in his bodily hunger. His body is hunger. He redirects his body and lays it on the ground in worship of not the enemy, but of Yahweh proclaiming his name. Does he repress his desire? Does he suppress his desire? No. It says he's hungry. I think he knows that. He redirects the desire to something deeper. He reorients his hunger from his flesh to his spirit. And he knows, as we will see soon from Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed, this is Jesus after the wilderness, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Filled. Why is he saying that? Because I think he just experienced a filling of the Holy Spirit in worship. God satisfies the hungry. He satisfies the thirsty. And part of the Lenten season is to make ourselves aware of the disordered desires of our flesh. That the devil actually plays to them with his lies, he plays to our disordered desires. Given that not all of our desires are good. Some of our desires are good and some of them are not. A couple of you all this past week were mentioning how I haven't referenced John Mark Homer in a while. So for you, here's what he has to say. The problem of the human condition isn't that we don't love. It's that we love either the wrong things or the right things, but in the wrong order. And that's, I think, our biggest temptation. It's not that we don't love good things, but they're in the wrong order. Rich Velotis says, the love of God doesn't remove our desires. It reorders them. It reorders them because it's our deepest desire that directs our life. It's our deepest longings and wants that motivate our way of living. So, we must examine ourselves and not so much ask today, what do I know about God? A lot of us use this phrase, I want to know more about God. No, no, no. I want you to want God. Certainly, I want you to get to know him and get to know facts and ideas and thoughts around who God is. But is Jesus your deepest longing, your deepest desire I don't want to know what beliefs you have necessarily. I want to know what is it that you love at the core of your being. Who do you love? What do you want? This is why Jesus' first question to the disciples in John is what do you want? What do you want? The longing of our innermost love and affection. Do you and I want Jesus? And do you want the same things that Jesus wants? Or is there malalignment in your life? Is there malalignment? And how am I curating that deepest love? How am I shaping that deepest love? Because our desires are curated. They take practice. Primarily through repetitive acts of worship. Means of grace that reorient our loves No one wakes up as a 10-year-old kid and loves crap third-wave coffee. No kid does. They spit it out of their mouth. It's gross. But over time, you begin to practice and begin to love and desire. There are so many things like that, so many foods that I eat now that if I ate that as a 7-year-old, I would have thrown up. You train yourself. You train your desires. And do you know how you usually train your desires? Through imitation. You want what someone else has. The work of Rene Girard deals deals a lot with mimetic desire, mimetic theory. 
Do you want the essence of Jesus' being? Is that your highest want? Or is it the essence of the enemy? Attractive, but hollow. Beautiful, but with no roots. Exciting, but dying. I'm struck by C.S. Lewis, who has famously said that we are far too easily pleased. He describes little children playing in the mud, making mud pies in a slum, and they would rather do that, because that's all they know, than a life lived on holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, friends. We actually desire, I'm going to tell you this, too little. We don't need to minimize our wants, but enlarge them, expand them. Because we often want crumbs when he offers a banquet. We want crumbs on the floor when he offers an endless buffet. You don't want enough. You're more concerned with do you know enough. I'm more concerned do you want enough. Mildred Bangs Wine Coop. Grandma Mildred, someone I also love. God does not force his way into the heart. He excites the jaded hopes of men until the old cheap loves look shoddy and corrupt. So what if I said today that you are you when you're hungry? You're just not you and all you hunger for is a Snickers bar. You are you when you're hungry. But if all you are craving is a Snickers bar, thinking that's what's going to satisfy, that's not you. That's not you. So I close with the question I opened with. What are you hungry for today? And will you choose to worship even if you aren't hungry?